Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today we're pleased to bring you our uh, third installment in the E4C seminar series. Um, for those of you who are new to the series, the series is spearheaded by ASME's Engineering for Global Development Research Committee, and its purpose is to intellectually develop the field of engineering for global development. Each month, uh, we host a new research institution to learn about their work, advancing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and more. Today's seminar will uh, be focusing on the work uh, done by Dr. Nathan Johnson um, at the um, Arizona State University, ASU. And I am Yana Aranda, and I am the president here at Engineering for Change, and I'll be one of the moderators for today's web, uh, seminar. The seminar you're participating in today will be archived on E4C and on our YouTube channel. Both of the URLs where those will be archived are listed on the slide in front of you. Upcoming information, information on upcoming seminars is available on the same page. If you're an E4C member, you will be receiving invitations to upcoming seminars directly. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for future topics and speakers, we invite you to contact our team at research at engineeringforchange.org. And if you're on Twitter today, we invite you to join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C Seminar Series. Now, before we move on to our presenter, I'd like to tell you about a bit about Engineering for Change. E4C is a knowledge organization, digital platform, and global community of over 1 million people around the globe, including engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists who are leveraging technology to improve quality of life for underserved communities. These challenges may be access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy solutions, so much we'll be talking about today, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you all to become members of E4C. Membership is free and provides access to news and thought leaders, insights on hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and current opportunities such as jobs, fellowships, funding, calls, and more. E4C members also receive exclusive invitations to online and regional events and access to resources aligned to their interests. Uh, you can learn more by visiting our website and signing up. Given our focus as a research community, we want to highlight some of E4C's research work, which cuts across geographies and sectors to deliver an ecosystem view of technology for good. Original research is conducted by E4C's research fellows annually on behalf of our partners, clients, and collaborators. It is delivered as digestible reports with implementable insights. We invite you to visit the research page, the URL is listed on this slide, and explore our field insights, research collaborations, and review of the State of Engineering for Global Development, a compilation of the academic programs and institutions offering training in the sector. If you have research questions or want to work with us on a research project as a research fellow, please contact us at research at engineeringforchange.org. And I'm really excited to share that we have an uh, innovation challenge running on E4C right now, focused on expediting solutions related to the United Nations to Sustainable Development Goals for Zero Hunger and Clean Water. The Innovate for Impact FEMA's Design Challenge aims to nurture breakthrough ideas and apply human-centered design to engineer innovative hardware solutions that help achieve these SDGs by 2030. You can learn more and submit your ideas at engineeringforchange.org forward slash Siemens Challenge. Please know that applications are open now to all E4C members, but they will close by April 3rd, 2020. So hurry and submit your innovations and please do share this opportunity widely. We're trying to get the brightest and brightest to contribute to their ideas. Now, with all of that out of the way, I wanted to uh, invite you all to help us uh, really understand how to use the WebEx platform. So we're going to take a moment to practice. Please right now, in the chat window, that's par uh, tell us where in the world you are joining us from. For those of you who might not see the chat window, it is located to the bottom right of your screen. If the chat window is not open, then take a look uh, in the middle of the slides at the very bottom, and there's an icon there for the chat. So I see folks are already replying. 
All right, uh, a few from New York, including us. Uh, Buenos Aires, uh, we have New Delhi, Minnesota, Vancouver, uh, California, Chicago, Washington State, Boulder, Ann Arbor. Welcome, welcome everyone from Ohio to Rome, uh, from North Carolina and Ghana. Fantastic, it's a, it's a pleasure to see you all here. I do see some of you replying in the Q&A window. Uh, please note that the Q&A window will be for questions for our presenters. So uh, if you do not see the chat window, again, go to the icon on the bottom of the slides in the middle and, and you will see that to open it. So welcome from Ecuador, England and, and Hungary, all of you, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Now, with that, I'm so thrilled to introduce today's presenter. Dr. Nathan Johnson is an associate professor at the Polytechnic School of the Ira A. Fulton Schools of Engineering at Arizona State University. His work translates academic research to deployment for projects in the areas of energy access, grid modernization, microgrids, and critical infrastructure. Dr. Johnson is also an active educator with training and workforce development programs in and outside the university. At ASU, Dr. Johnson leads the Laboratory for Energy and Power Solutions, short form LEAPS, uh, that creates technical and business solutions that facilitate the global transition to a resilient, low carbon economy. Uh, before joining ASU, he worked in product development and business development for the energy sector with projects across 15 countries. And we've known Nate for a number of years and are very honored to have him back with us. He is going to be joined by our moderator and one of the architects of the series, Dr. Jesse Austin Brenneman. I will not repeat your entire bio this time, Jesse, um, in order to make sure that we have plenty of time for Nate. And with that, I'm gonna hand over uh, the control of the slides to Nate and uh, excited to hear your insights, Nate. Perfect, thanks, Yana, for the introduction. I'm really happy to talk to everyone uh, joining us today. It's uh, great to be back. Uh, as Yana was saying, I was here uh, about eight years ago for some of the earlier parts of the E4C series. And as the community has developed over time, uh, since the early 80s, 90s, and even through to today, to look at the transition of both the discipline, the focus areas of which we work, and then also the career paths that we take to grow a vibrant community by which we can uh, provide impactful solutions and then accelerate the scope and scale of that change. Today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, several different types of projects that relate under this broad concept of climate change, uh, conflict, and then also engineering for peace. To start, to mention for a moment kind of the breadth of work of where things have come for the last 10 to 15 years uh, in my team and our focus areas, it's mainly to indicate that we've worked on durable goods or consumer products uh, with BP cooking stoves for a few million people, fast moving consumer goods for Nestle. And then about 10 years ago, that translated into off-grid power infrastructure for communities in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so looking at those different realms of engineering, designing products that go into homes, uh, things in small sachets you would buy into stores for food, uh, food items and sanitation, but then also critical infrastructure, power and water systems, our perspective on how we approach those systems became actually quite similar, noting, however, that the instantiation of the engineering discipline and the problem-solving skills might be fairly uniform after we're able to structure and properly defend and uh, characterize the problem. So that came to, as uh, Jan was saying, our laboratory for energy and power solutions. We're a group of 30 people at Arizona State. I came back to the university for an attempt to provide a career trajectory and uh, training for people wanting to provide and work on engineering solutions that provided substantive change in three uh, what we'd say broad sectors of the world. First being humanitarian, second being civilian, and then third being military. And how do we create the basic science and applied engineering that can then be instantiated across these different user groups? And a lot of these uh, application spaces have synergies, and as we think about the types of vulnerabilities that natural disasters and cyber attacks can instantiate on the world, the common lessons that we've uh, grown will be shared with you in a couple different examples. One thing that I'd like to mention is being an academic now and then putting on my private sector hat and how we create products that go beyond publication to something that is in the hands of an individual providing improved quality of life or enhanced resilience is we are first understanding from an academic side what 
Um, what are the new areas of work or the cutting edge technologies that we can curate? And then how does that map to the experience working in the private sector, understanding specifically the user needs, the, what the user wants, going through a business model canvas to identify the potential cash flow models associated with those, to create something of which we call innovation. And being an engineer, it doesn't always need to be in technology or product at the top. It actually might be the evolution or the creation of the new process, or as I'll talk about at the end of the day, more focused on people and training and capacity. And then when we look at the solution, it's a combination usually of one or more of these. And so again, it's not just technology saying that as an engineer, but how do we get those services to people, uh, the cost and financing associated with it, because at the end of the day, it's not just improved uh, access to power and water, but at what cost and at what resilience. And then the warranty and maintenance of those systems post implementation to make sure they're sustainable and then leading into the training. To mention briefly about climate change, and, and as, a, as an engineer, uh, we utilize climate change models, but the topic and focus of today's conversation isn't to go into the depths of how we model and project the, the impacts of climate change. The basic premise here is to indicate that climate change is happening, it's always happening, it's presently happening, happening faster than it usually does, and that is primarily attributed to anthropogenic or human causes. Now, when we look about the effects of climate change, often we think about it in terms of the slow increase in the heat of the Earth, a couple degrees Fahrenheit in some areas and potentially 10 to 15 degrees Fahrenheit in other areas, but then also the increasing incidence of extreme weather events, uh, storms, uh, multiple days in excess of 120 degrees Fahrenheit, specifically in Arizona, but then also mega droughts lasting greater than 30 years which if we think about the Syrian instance and the refugees flooding into Lebanon and Jordan as shown on the left, the common thought or approach or uh, understanding now is that given the, the drought, which was exacerbated by climate change, that led to increasing incidence of conflict given uh, traditional or historical ethnic or cultural divides uh, and socioeconomic status divides. And so the, the act or change of that climate and the drought that it caused exacerbated existing causes for people to potentially have disagreements. And now we're seeing about 70 million people uh, displaced or refugees in some capacity or another. Now, when we think about the E4C community um, focused on um, uh, developing countries, providing access, where my work is also gravitated to encompass is realizing that 55% of the Earth's population today reside in urban centers and in a couple decades, it's going to be as close as two-thirds of the population reside in urban centers. What about a natural disaster hitting a town of 20 million people or a city? What about the settlements that have no formal mechanism for power and water services and sanitation? What happens after a conflict and you need to reconstruct, as in the upper right, the systems that have been repaired? How do defense um, uh, communities around the world mobilize and respond to conflicts or disasters? And even cities in the United States, it's actually blacked out in, the, the, in Manhattan, um, which blacked out 70,000 people. And more recently, as you're aware, in California with the forest fires causing power outages to over a million people and then issues and fatalities as a result of that losing uh, power to critical services. And so when I take a look at the breadth of the concern, it is, yes, still focused on uh, off-grid areas, emerging markets, and threatened communities. But just because we're in an urban environment, industrialized economy, doesn't mean that we're not susceptible to disasters and threats. And we really need to appreciate that as we think about our, uh, our role and scope of engineering for change. To talk to you a little bit about our philosophy and how we approach this, and uh, understanding the scope of what's possible, if I, as a standards-making entity, IEEE, ASCP, uh, ANSI, or other groups, have done an amazing job creating uh, qualities and standards based upon professional consensus and mathematical rigor to show what we should design today. Given the challenges that we're seeing in the world getting hotter, drier in certain areas, changing needs around the world, those standards will need to be reevaluated. And they are reevaluated every few years and updated. Now, what we found out in that is that also the design process that we follow and how do we reach those standards may not be as linear as we once thought it is. And so that's why I have that illustration on the right showing that we need to create in a university and in practice what we would classify as problem finders. 
where you may not know what the problem is because you're not aware of the dynamics because you haven't been uh, exposed to the types of stresses or stressful events because we haven't seen them before. Or a 500 year event is all of a sudden a 50 year event. And so some work financed by the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy uh, and the Office of Naval Research provided us with the capacity to do this domestically, which we're now expanding to 10 countries and urban areas around the world. The reason that this is uh, focused on the United States is honestly part, uh, partly driven because we had access to the data and were able to model uh, over the course of 10 years, 20 years, 40 years and higher that we're looking on the order of a 7 to 10 percent reduction in the ability for electrical lines to carry power. And so essentially what that means is, is there uh, an extreme heat event or, or an outage or a power plant goes out, there's going to be less opportunity to route that power around to get to where it needs to be simply because the world is just a little bit hotter. And so if we took that and we expanded it out, not just into power systems, but we were say, okay, I'm a mechanical engineer, uh, Jan is a mechanical engineer, um, uh, Jesse, uh, ocean engineering and other disciplines. And if we just focus on our individual uh, technical specialities, we would often miss these additional stressors that would be created by cyber attacks natural disasters, and in some ways, kinetic strikes. And so then we're modeling coupled systems, power, water, gas, transportation. And to think of an interesting example here is if you were to take Mexico City and you were to put it in uh, this particular model and there was massive flooding that would occur, that would be a first order effect from rains. Second order effect would be that the substations get flooded or the power system goes out that provides power to the pumps to move the water out. The third order effect is now the water is rising even faster, and then you have people migrating, health effects that are exacerbated furthermore. And that's not something that you are trained or even able to produce the tools in any individual discipline, which is why my specialty at Arizona State now is in that broader and global system. So after exposing and looking at these different types of stressors, we're then able to understand how these unknown or, or pre, not previously foreseen circumstances affect a critical infrastructure. And then when we've done this for uh, metro or urban areas, we also see on the right-hand side uh, for the uh, a U.S. military installation that would need to respond in the event of a disaster. And we take a look at what are the critical points of failure on the system now that you're considering how it's physically designed and connected, which typically you wouldn't do at the point of design and install. And then coming to that question about how do we modularize uh, the infrastructure to be less susceptible to these types of failures, which is going to be the main part of the, the rest of my conversation. As we were looking at uh, microgrids and uh, providing power to areas that don't have them, and then also at urban infrastructure and how do we create an, an economy and stability of which is more susceptible to, or less susceptible, sorry, to the types of threats and failures that we're seeing. We're realizing at the exact same time is that there's a massive economic driver for renewable energy and distributed power systems that are more secure for uh, data centers, for off-grid communities, uh, for hospitals, for municipalities. And so there's this big pull from consumers and then there's this big push from funders of which, uh, just to give you one example for off grid power systems, uh, Nigeria, World Bank's uh, estimating about $350 million in the next five years going into off grid power systems just in that one country. The thing about that is that massive scale of demand and finances, uh, there's not enough industry or capability available and human resource bandwidth to execute on the size and scale of what's needed. And so then what we try to do is say, let's design faster ways to create uh, technical specialities and designs that can be instantiated. So this, what you see here, is showing uh, how we take uh, JS information, translate that into electrical design and analysis, and then over into financial information on the right. And uh, what we've done is in a partnership, for example, with Youth, Youth Mappers, that's a USAID-sponsored group, uh, started by Patricia Solis and Vivian Ar uh, Arianga, and then also PowerGen in association with uh, uh, Sam Slaughter and Frank Berg, is taking a look at different ways to gain primary data, create those into a geospatial domain without any power engineering involved, rapidly translate that into a power system design using advanced machine learning techniques to optimize 
where the line should go, where the assets should be for power generation, and then also take a look at the financial evaluation for is that going to make sense for everyone involved in association with a public-private partnership with Zindi and then another software package called the DSS to complete that form of analysis to provide that impact to everyone. Uh, here's a, just a quick example. So scaling the approach is you would see in the uh, uh, Niger for the community, uh, off-grid communities there on the left. And so again, with Power Gen Renew, about 1,000 people, Uganda, refugee settlements, I'll speak a little bit about that again in a second. And then with the Philippines uh, in the right, that tends to hundreds of thousands of people with another partnership, a German institute uh, ROI out of Berlin. And so again, the size and scale of uh, resilience, reliable and low cost power systems is quite significant. And how do we provide and leverage that same rapid acting approach to reduce the time by 90%, which therefore reduce costs, but then also improves efficacy of your project overall. As we were taking a look as well about um, the settlements that are working in, in Uganda and elsewhere, the settlements that uh, get 1,000 or five or 10,000 refugees each year naturally grow and uh, change over time. And so now we're starting to consider what is the natural evolution of a community over time as more inhabitants are added to it? And how do we create power systems in such a way that when we add additional uh, connections uh, or assets to those systems, is that we're not sacrificing power quality uh, costs uh, to the users or services. And so as, you see, as you see there on the lower left, uh, that's an indication of the power system voltage on the grid voltage in Uganda. And those red lines are actually the American National Standards Institute boundaries for the uh, quality of power that should be maintained uh, to provide stability and quality for the end user. What you see is there's clear violations that go outside of that, both above and below. And so you want to be in the middle of that, but that's typical if you're taking a, a Lego style block approach where you're just adding infrastructure onto it but not at the same time of understanding how do you maintain the quality of power. So how do we seamlessly add those connections and loads over time? To expand that and think about how would we potentially modularize that, this is one of those types of systems where we can add it and then I'll also sacrifice the quality of the, the power, water, and other systems actually deployed, is we recently deployed a turnkey clinic. Uh, this is in northern Uganda for about 12,000 people. It serves 700 patients per week, and this is critically important that those patients not only include the refugees, but then also the citizens of Uganda. As we're working in Lebanon and Jordan in uh, refugee relief operations, uh, the countries have been accepting in uh, millions of refugees from Syria uh, and doing so with open arms, uh, providing land and then access to services, while the influx of foreign aid was often on, uh, going to foreign contracts. And so then the question is, well, after doing this for five years, 10 years, and 20 years, how does helping others, uh, when does that maybe become too much of a burden? So then we change the format of the work, not just to help refugees, but help refugee-affected communities, provide economic development. Um, this system has been online for four months right now. You see at the bottom uh, the power system installed. Uh, the first um, uh, person coming in for a diagnosis is shown in the middle. And then the right is the water system coming out of the, the right side. Um, going on just a bit, I'm going to show you a quick video of this system coming together. So let me share that with you. So imagine if you're in your house, you put the light switch, the lights don't come on, you don't have power running to your home, you don't have water running to your home. How do you provide that in the middle of nowhere? And that is what off-grid technology is all about. The Office of Naval Research funded the research and construction of this prototype turnkey medical clinic. Once it was designed and fabricated, the decision about how to deploy the clinic was left up to us. This system has use cases like humanitarian applications, disaster response scenarios, and military operations. We're building the first prototype here in Phoenix, Arizona, but we're going to be deploying this to the Isle of Who refugee camp in northern Uganda. We evaluated sites to deploy our clinic in the humanitarian context, and we came across an organization called Medical Teams International. Uh, they were actually the organization staffing and running the medical clinic in the Isla 2 refugee camp that was visited. 
So we partnered with them to launch the first prototype as they have the knowledge and staff and history to use the system to its full potential in areas that can use a little bit of additional support and infrastructure. So this is a really great low risk way to deploy this first prototype and evaluate how effective it is in providing clean water, stable power, and a little bit of extra healthcare capacity for them. Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Yep, thanks. Um, so then the clinic actually is thinking about rapidly developing and putting systems together. The design process and lead time to get into some of the components took a couple months, but then the full system assembly actually was completed in under a week, uh, both the clinic, the power, and the water system. And that brings us to essentially then the question after the technical design, um, understanding the contractual mechanisms to create and uh, provide products outside of university goes to the uh, question of essentially logistics. And so now the question or challenge for us is how do we create these systems uh, regionally that can be deployed, uh, deployed quite rapidly in the event of a disaster. Uh, one thing I'll also note to you is that when we think about uh, the fragility of power systems and how they're connected and how we might modularize those, this is some work uh, that was uh, driven by the Electric Utility Center here, Electric Utilities in the United States, uh, Defense Department, and then also emerging market off-grid power system designers, is how do we create smart intelligence systems that look out or forecast in the future so they can do a better job of scheduling critical loads, communal loads, uh, and scheduling solar batteries and then also generators to provide lower cost and more reliable energy. So this is just a brief example of what this looks like for, um, for one on-grid example, and I'll show you the off-grid, of how these types of forecasting methods and adaptive control reduce the operating costs by a little over 30%. And so that's extremely important because not only are we providing the technical sophistication that provides value to the academic society, but then that monetary savings is what's going to provide some sustainability and scaling in the future. Noting that between the, the left um, column there and the, the column just to the right of it is the cost saved with the microgrid technology. And then the two columns to the right are the additional advanced controls that allow additional cost savings and resilience to be maintained. Similarly, as you take a look at uh, there in the lower right with the amount of fuel savings uh, achieved, based upon optimizing to uh, reduce your fuel use, but then also providing capacity in the form of additional energy stored in the battery in the case of any outages in the distribution network, the generators, or others. And so you see that in the upper right as that optimized line in the orange, an increase of about 9% in what we call survivability. And so that's the ability for an isolated system to maintain the quality of power and the power in the event of a grid out. We've uh, worked then with a public-private partnership. Again, as a university, we're not what we would call an engineering procurement and construction firm. And so then we would partner and, and provide our, uh, our controls patents and our work to a third party that would then go install the systems. One group that I would encourage you to take a look at is GEDO out of Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, these folks have installed off-grid power systems about 500 megawatts in different locations of the world. And now they've taken this vendor agnostic approach that when you design a system, then you add our controls to it, they're handling the machine-to-machine -machine communication between the different entities, and then we're providing the ability to schedule and control those assets for improved reliability and reduced cost in a very flexible manner. So we're doing that right now with individual uh, microgrids with a single brain. And I know someone out there is going to ask me, so what happens when you look to that example of the power system design and the community expanding over time, uh, that might have multiple brains or, or multiple different nodes. And that's actually where we go to understand what might we benefit from nature. And so this comes to a concept known as biomimicry. And we actually look to dolphins. And uh, many people might look to how do you control distributed power systems with representation of how bees swarm or potentially how birds flock. But what we realize is that the local power quality control is going to be completed at the individual devices to maintain the quality of the overall system. But each one of these distributed assets needs to be dispatched locally to meet local needs and then provide grid support 
So it needs to be a little bit selfish in some ways. And so instead of looking at how do we just look at aggregate uh, dynamics of a group, we need to provide individual benefit, benefit to a local community, and then to the team. And so what we look at is dolphins, and more specifically, we actually look and borrow the computational mathematical derivatives for uh, dolphin mating behavior. And as we apply this to power systems, what we find out is that each one of these individual uh, uh, microgrid nodes or power systems needs to become aware of another entity and then build trust of that entity, a reputation, and then a sense of value of is it going to be uh, essential to trade or negotiate power with them or reserve power when they need it? And then these uh, intelligent agents then communicate and then share that information in a way that provides and doesn't sacrifice the individual's ability to meet their loads and then shares any excess back to the community itself. Lastly, what I'll talk about here is a bit on training. And so if we took a look at the scale of need and how the energy economy is changing, the, uh, the amount of folks versed in uh, climate change, and then also everyone on the phone call working in engineering for peace and related areas in electrical engineering, uh, power systems, water systems, civil engineering, we realize that we simply need more of us. And while we're a distributed group of capable people, we actually need on the order of thousands, tens of thousands and more. And so what my team started to do about three years ago is provide training on off-grid power systems and critical power systems and hybrid power systems to uh, U.S. service veterans who are transitioning out from uh, experience as an electrician's mate working with generators and then finding that the uh, uh, corresponding roles in the private sector in the utility industry had advanced so far fa uh, further that their skill sets no longer matched up. And so we developed what's called the microgrid boot camp to provide those uh, critical experiences and work in a one week uh, hands-on format, very intensive. And we deliver this four times a year and now as we're scaling and understanding that we are, need to be training uh, executives, uh, managers, uh, engineers, operators, and technicians across the entire industry that's changing, we've now created a series of format, and you see some of those examples in the, in the bottom there, where it's focused on professional credentialing and continuing education credits so that domestic utilities, um, owners and operators and systems, and then as we've trained uh, folks doing off-grid power system development in Sub-Saharan Africa, East Asia, and the Middle East as well, how do we create regional centers of excellence and a continuing capacity to, uh, to provide for the future? Uh, one thing as I'll get uh, to the close here is to indicate as well is that uh, when I thought about my time in industry and why I came back to the universities to help set up a program that trained and created capacity for growing a needed workforce, that doesn't just need to start in uh, university education, it needs to start beforehand. And so we developed this microgrid on a desk, you see some of the components there on the lower left, and that's a physical system with different voltage levels that you can plug and play much like Lego blocks that mimic a real world power system. And then you have an interactive game and tablet in the middle. You can click on it, you uh, indicate grid outages, you work on off-grid communities, on-grid communities, and what is it gonna take to provide reliable and low-cost power. And then as you see there on the lower right, that's an example of a pilot we recently did with a fifth grade class. And now we're doing that with high school classes as well, and expanding that with a technology uh, educational technology vendor, Horizon uh, Technologies, to then create thousands of these things so that we can provide not just the STEM education that's more needed in K through 12, but then also the exposure of those individuals and those children going through school on what might be a future career path. As I was told when I was in high school, you know, you like science and math, so become an engineer, but there's hundreds of different types of engineers so now we're talking about the engineering specialities and then also the types of occupations at a young age so people can think about where their future might be. And a lot of that work that we've done uh, wouldn't be possible without a fairly broad selection of partners and advisors. And so I always want to stop for a moment and thank them, both uh, federal and international sponsors, uh, private sector sponsors, nonprofits, a variety of par uh, partners for uh, technology commercialization and delivery and then also advisors that help keep us up to date 
uh, and review our work uh, quarterly to give us insights on what the future might be and where we should end up going. And so with that, you see my contact information there. Um, you can feel free to reach out to me at any time and there's a website for some more information. And with that, I'll uh, pass it back to you. Thank you so much, Nate. That was fantastic. And um, I'm going to actually hand off to Jesse uh, to take us through our, our discussion. Sure. So um, again, Nate, thank you so much for uh, sharing all those projects and, and really more about your approach and the way you're making sort of academic contributions, contributions to the partners and uh, groups that you're working with, as, as well as trying to have impact on the real world problem. I think that was a really nice summary of, a, a, you know, addressing all of those areas and the role in which academia and, and research can have in trying to provide uh, more efficient and, and useful services. Uh, I'm going to try and uh, address some of the questions that came up in the chat. So if you have questions, uh, as I said, please just chat them and I'll try and summarize them. Um, but Nate, well, one of the things that I'd like to start with, and, and we've had a couple of questions on this, is building, it seems like, you know, you put up that partner slide at the end where you had all of, all of the different people that were involved. How do you go about, and then you also talked about curating the problem to try and find something where you could really have a value add. How do you go about building that team throughout those projects? And, and I just know from talking to you that these are multi-year relationships that you're developing, right? How do you go about building that team and, and assessing is this a problem that, you know, I can curate in a positive way um, from the academic side, but also this is the right, you know, partnership to get me to the to a solution that's, that's really impactful. So can you talk a little bit about your process for forming that team over time. Are there different stages? How do you go about thinking about who it is you're working with? Yeah, very good question. So thinking uh, for locations for our work anywhere in the world. Uh, oftentimes, we get a phone call to work on a particular project or a problem, and the end user will have uh, an idea of how to potentially solve or resolve that problem. Um, that's been common for international work or domestic work or anywhere, and I'm not saying that's, that's wrong or bad, but what's more important is not having an idea of how you might solve it, it's more a, a prioritization of the goals or objectives and so then we move into a, a goal setting and problem scoping process where we also involve the potential stakeholders that might be connected to a particular problem space. And as we take a look at um, opera electrification, on electrification, there are differences often, uh, there could be differences of opinion on how those are handled or investigated, uh, or if it's a microgrid or a renewables based system or a diesel based system. And utilizing the techniques uh, with Zindi and the design practices allow us to rapidly illustrate in real time how those objectives and those priorities map to potential technical solution sets. And that's extremely valuable because then suddenly we take a conversation that's engaging and move beyond a whiteboard session to real technical and financial details instead of saying, we'll come back to you in two weeks. And so that level of, that gives a lot more confidence to everyone in the room and clarity about the accuracy of what we're talking about to resolve a lot of the confusion about what's possible. And then after that, it's relatively straightforward uh, process to execution. That's great. Uh, so I think it's really important. One of the takeaways that, that I had and thought of that I just wanna to reiterate, and I don't wanna put words in your mouth, but I'm trying to summarize this idea of being able to rapidly show potential design. So you put a lot of work into having that methodology say, okay, if these are your priorities and this is your context and your situation, here are potential technical design spaces that might work for you. Having that ability to do it sort of in real time really gives you an advantage when having that discussion with stakeholders. Is that, is that, that sort of the, one of the points that I'm coming away with? That, it's quite that true. Matter? And I'd also say in that regard that our disciplinary training, yes, in many ways silos us, but more specifically 
provides us with scripted problem solving processes and a vocabulary that limits our creative potential to imagine futures that could be better at resolving the goals that we have. And by mm -hmm. having these, these real-time evaluation mechanisms, it allows us to fully unlock our creativity and step aside from our embedded assumptions and practices. And that's often hard to do because at the end of the day, engineers are paid to make assumptions. We make good assumptions, but we make assumptions. And the human mind naturally fills in details. And so we need to be in a position where we can show how we creatively develop an, an opportunity space that innovates uh, across not just basic science, but across the realm for everyone to be involved and everyone to benefit. Sure. Oh, so so that brings in, a, a, you know, a lot of you're tying together, you know, we made this innovation in terms of how we're even having that conversation with the stakeholders. But I really like you framing it in that way of saying, look, normally our stakeholder conversations go like this in the past, but we've really spent some time putting our thought into how do we improve those conversations so we can quickly get to solutions and build that team and build confidence and buy-in from that team to be able to have successful projects. I think it's really great. We had a couple of questions here about community involvement. So just extending that stakeholder conversation a little bit, could you talk a little bit about, you know, we focused on microgrids or off-grid, and you talked about as these communities develop, how that sort of, do they come back to the grid? How does, how do, are you seeing trajectories for growth of, of the community and the capacity they need and the solution space? So at the original conversation, you might be in one solution space, but as they grow, maybe they're transitioning to somewhere else. Um, and that's all context dependent and stakeholder dependent. How do you have those conversations? Because you've thought a lot about the operating and sort of the dynamic nature of these systems. How do you have that conversation early on with stakeholders so they, they can understand the potential of where they want to go based on their own goals? Yeah, good question. When it comes maybe specifically to the refugee settlements they work with, the host nation is going to be very prescriptive about what's permitted. Uh, sometimes those communities can be just temporary, semi-permanent or permanent, and based upon where the host country will allow those communities uh, to, to be or to develop will drastically change the format of the infrastructure. Uh, the turnkey system that I showed with the clinic is an example of a semi-permanent insulation that can move over time as permitted. Um, Usually, the, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, the host nation country, and then the, uh, the refugee leaders will have developed a strategy for are they going to be around for months uh, or years or potentially permanently. And then that will advise the process that we follow in the problem curation and then also the design of what capacity the community is. And so, uh, as a result of that, we'll then show, okay. Uh, for your community projections and growth, uh, it is most easy to think about these larger building blocks, which might be one to four acres at a time, of these number of people with these types of systems, and then you can build out those in a relatively uh, organic manner, but it's, uh, and then you can add individual connections onto that. When it comes from an operations perspective, there's uh, certain times where we would train local owners and operators of the systems, more so what we find though is with the technical sophistication of solar inverters, battery management systems, and then also the, uh, the, the, the warranty requirements is we'll need a third party vendor locally, a, a business that uh, can provide maintenance services uh, if and as needed. Because post install flying over to take a Uganda as an example, that is a bit, uh, troublesome or challenging if it's just a minor issue in the course involved. And so in that particular example, Solar now provides the warranty and maintenance contract for all of our refugee installations that are working in Uganda. And they have a two-hour turnaround service. And they have the technical capacity uh, centralized to then distribute out and drive around to those locations in the event of any issue. And that covers a bit about the conversation that we have in terms of how a community might evolve but then when it comes to operations, uh, where and how that might that capacity be retained to then continue to develop, uh, or, sorry, provide high quality, low cost power. Sure, great. Thank you. So 
I, I want to push, push on that. I want to extend that question a little bit. Um, you talk a lot about thinking about, okay, what are these system contexts that affect the optimal operating strategy or design of these power grids? And there's sort of two areas that I think your expertise, maybe you could share some of your experience with us. And one of those is like thinking about these different stakeholders that are perhaps bigger. So you talked about sort of the maintenance stakeholder, who's the business that's taking over this maintenance contract and doing that moving forward. What about like regulatory bodies? You talked about the High Commission for Refugees in the host country. How are you bringing those stakeholders into your team and understanding, okay, what is the possible impact or constraints we have because of the energy policies of the host country or different government ministries or et cetera, how are you making sure that you're accounting for all of those different stakeholders when, you know, you talked about gas, electric, you know, all of these coupled systems and there's different stakeholders even within a single host country government that are affecting those and you need to understand all of those to make your design decisions. How are you navigating that process? What is your approach for trying to understand those types of effects? The, the, the simple and cheeky answer would say, we handle it with great difficulty. <laughs> uh, what, what we tend to do originally after being invited in by what the social scientists would call a gatekeeper, which is a person who is familiar with you and then also familiar with the local context and, and some of the stakeholders, is create a, some form of systems diagram or mapping that indicates the relationships between uh, organizations, uh, energy, matter, and data. And I know those seem very disparate, but when we talk about the, the, the people component, the regulatory component, the, the physical uh, quantities of systems moving around, the data and flow of information, and then obviously the exchange of energy, which is my speciality. We need to understand the flow of those to then uh, realize how they relate and who might have influence if they're related to one another. And then after that, it helps influence who might or should be involved. And then we go forward with a, a sometimes it's individual in person meetings uh, before a larger stakeholder meeting. Sometimes you go right to a stakeholder meeting with a larger group. It depends on the, the circumstance, context, and then also the potential sensitivity of any of the stakeholders to feel left out. And so sometimes as a result of that, um, we need to move straight forward to a bigger meeting. Other times it's not needed. And sometimes to speak to one of the stakeholders, we actually need to go through a higher level or a different stakeholder. And that's why that importance of the gatekeeper is quite important. Uh, uh, cannot be understated, I should say. Um, uh, uh, because they are going to be that conduit and provide the relationship for us to uh, gain confidence both bi-directionally for the community and then also for us. Can I build on that question a little bit, Jesse and, and Nate, mm -hmm. given that context, how do you ensure that your team is equipped with the right understanding to conduct that kind of analysis? Uh, do you upskill, you know, the team uh, through other training or by involving other departments? That, I don't want to answer this, but I'm just really curious to understand how, you know, you build that capacity in, internally for your for your own within ASU. Yeah, that's a good question. It's there's not many formalized processes that I would say that I've seen around the world. Um, what we've done is within the School of Sustainability at Arizona State, they've done a good job about preparing. Uh, cohorts of 20 to 40 individuals per year to um, uh, live and work in communities around the world, and that provides the capacity for uh, some cultural sensitivity, training, and awareness of different individuals and groups. And then what my group would then layer on to that is, is more uh, uh, directed on uh, individual coaching on the practices involved in the project. And then as we understand the influence of culture or the local yeah. environment, we'll have, um, uh, we'll take some liter literary samples of the situations we're going to be involved in or the country and we'll have discussion groups about the first person perspectives, for example, of someone being a refugee for seven years and what life was like uh, going through conflict, getting separated from their family, moving, you know, around for four to five years and then trying to figure out who they are. And it's really hard to, you know, put yourself in there in someone else's shoes 
but those stories, whether they be in print uh, or in um, visual media, have been extremely informative to sensitize people to the types of experiences they might have. So, then we have the training and support for the social research methods and our anthropology friends uh, once we get to on-ground interaction. Yeah. Yeah, that's, Thank that's you. great. Uh, thank you, Nate. And I think, um, you know, really important sharing, sort of building that interdisciplinary team to get, you know, to make important engineering decisions, to make the right ones. We need to have that kind of system level understanding of the stakeholders on a human level, but also like sort of thinking of the different stakeholders you've been talking about. Um, I had a question around, you know, following this thought, you talked about data and the existence of data. You know, you presented that one where you're talking about machine learning. And I, I noticed you said, okay, we can model the American when we have existing data. And in fact, you know, my group is doing some transportation modeling. And, um, you know, the U.S. has very, very good data that's mandated by the government that needs to be collected. But in one, many other cases, we don't have that data existing. And so it's interesting to me that you've built up these mechanisms for trying to say, how do we collect this data? How do we create what we need in order to make our engineering decisions? Can you talk about some of your experiences around collecting data and, and thinking about that um, in cases, in many of these cases where we don't have good information? Right. Um, my earlier experiences was collecting primary data, um, being in, in different areas of the world, either individually with small groups of five to ten people, uh, going to some of the larger studies where we'd hire out marketing firms like Nielsen, and 500 people at a time to collect you know, survey data on, you know, like 100,000 people. And that is time intensive, resource intensive, and really, really expensive. Now, what we're finding is that um, uh, some of the major funding agencies and off-grid power systems would uh, size or spec out, would we do a grid extension or an off-grid power system or a solar home system, uh, utilizing, um, uh, maybe some back of the envelope rules uh, to do those system estimations. And while that gets us to a certain level of accuracy for, for certain decisions, at the scale that we're considering with hundreds of millions of dollars going in and needing to provide the technical efficacy and then the bankability of these, we need to get to higher levels of data quality without spending, you know, a week to uh, uh, maybe a couple weeks in each individual community because there's just so many. So then what we've done with, um, uh, with the JS information and then an automated process through uh, machine learning and pattern matching to identify structures and then draw out where the electrical lines will be allows us to um, reduce the human resource time uh, by you know, 95% or more. And now we can do more villages. And then the one thing that we don't have locally, if we do from GS information, of course, would be how many people might be in the community, uh, what might be their potential user demand profile. And so that we actually get our scrape from national data sets uh, or WHO data sets, for example, on the, the amount of people in the community and their typical behaviors. And then we merge those two systems together to then estimate what would the system be in a way that um, uh, not only includes the local the, the locations of everything, but now actually does the power engineering because if we just estimated what's needed based without doing actually any engineering at all, it's a you know good question of did you actually size the system right? And what we're finding out is that you might be 50% too small or 50% too large. And when you're talking about you know am I going to be able to meet the loads in the community or am I going to design a system that's so overbuilt? that no one's going to use it, and then it's just going to financially fail. Those are some pretty big boundaries of it doesn't meet the needs because it's not big enough, and it's going to fiscally fail because no one's using power. And unfortunately, that's how systems are being designed now. So we're trying to narrow that boundary of error down to be a lot smaller to make better decisions. I'm going to make a shameless plug here on that note. Um, for uh, all of our listeners uh, for the, we have an off-grid energy webinar series that was uh, delivered by Henry Louis, Dr. Henry Louis out of Seattle, um, who 
spoke quite at length and provided some context on sizing systems correctly and providing that background. And, and it's a six part series, totally free. I put the link up in the chat. So I think that's a critical point that you've raised, Nate, and something that needs to be addressed. Perfect. All right, um, I'm just going to ask one last question, Niana, because I think we're, we're almost out of time. And this has just been amazing, Nate, the, the, what you've shared in your approach. Uh, I, I want to be clear that the purpose of the seminar when we started it and, and sort of got, had you come and speak was to have this kind of learning across the different disciplines, like what can people draw from your experiences and your approach? And I think there's a lot there from the stakeholder mapping from the using social science and, and interdisciplinary teams, building the right team, looking at those partnerships, and then using some of the state of the art algorithms and thinking about operation over time to really design the right systems and get better performance and, and fiscal performance. Uh, on that note, I'd like to ask about the adaptive system. So you talked a lot about sort of this operating strategy and forecasting and using machine learning both to build the structure and design it, but then also in the operation of it. So with your touch controls and all of those things, can you talk about like how you see implementing that, making this even a feasible type of solution, right? So you talked about the fiscal sort of cost of these systems. Um, looking at the graph that you showed, sort of that bar chart, it really only is once you apply these state-of-the-art algorithms that it seems like we're bringing it really into that range. You're getting a lot of savings from that. Can you talk about how you sort of came to that conclusion and where you see it might be applying in other areas of either power delivery or even in other types of systems. Right. Uh, happy to speak to that. The, the illustrations provided our, our, our demonstrated savings numbers and our, uh, our partner Gito has installed, uh, I think it was 20 systems within the last uh, 18 months. And so that provides the, the examples uh, domestically, uh, in Puerto Rico or other locations around the world with how um, these types of offerings or solutions and adaptability provide the benefit. Um, if I was to think maybe to a translated to another area of work um, in the communications sector, right now we're also considering uh, the linkages between power, water, and cyber systems and how we can optimize that, again, getting back to maybe drop in the human component for a second, um, or considering it another way, but the flow of energy, uh, matter, and communication, and the needs for to meet the, that community, how do we optimize the real-time delivery of all of those systems and potentially reduce our capacity to provide water for a short period of time as we need more energy or use additional energy for water that's needed in case of some certain event to meet those rapidly changing human needs in real time. So that's something that I would see those, those same methods could be applied by altering for the, the folks out there that have an optimization background, um, the optimization function and the constraints associated with those with, uh, to double down on that reinforcing, reinforcement learning mechanisms that are goal seeking that can change the interests in real time as the system learns about how the community behaves and That's amazing. I love it. Uh, so matching with a lot of stuff that we're, we're looking at similar um, uh, in reinforcement learning, et cetera. So thank you very much, Nate. I really appreciate uh, sh your sharing of the insights. It's been amazing. This is really achieving all the goals that I had uh, in trying to hear about people's work. You're, you're, you're too kind, uh, from them. Uh, No, I'm just saying, you know, like, I think we want to build these, these connections across the different subfields. So you're in energy and power distribution, but you're presenting it in a way that can inform my work in design, but also other people's works, whether they're in wash or transportation or some other area. So I think it's really great. Uh, Yana, would you like to talk about our, our next speaker, perhaps? And yes, then we'll say goodbye. Absolutely. Thanks to everyone for attending. Yeah, actually, I think uh, there's a tremendous complementarity between what you shared today, Nate, and April's presenter, who will be Evan Thomas, who is currently the director of the Morton Center of Global Engineering um, at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Many of their programs and their projects are similarly multidisciplinary, uh, really at that systems level. So uh, I really invite all of our seminar participants today to join us in 
in April to hear from uh, Dr. Thomas and about some of the approaches they have at Mortensen. Um, and with that, I know we are at time and I would like to be respectful of your time and thank you everyone for attending today. We know there were a lot of questions and we're sorry if we didn't tackle all of them. We truly apologize if we didn't uh, tackle your question. Uh, please feel free to email us uh, or email uh, Nate directly there. Uh, we included his contact info in the chat window um, because we kind of moved through the slides fairly quickly. Um, and do join us as E4C members so you can hear about upcoming seminars. With that, I'd like to thank you, Jesse and Nate, for joining us today. Thank you, everyone, from all around the globe, and we'll catch you on the next series in April. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.